Hey everyone, welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then um, Marianne's going to give her presentation. And during the presentation, you can post any questions in the chat and we'll get them answered um, at the end of the presentation. This is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube typically within a day. About Data Umbrella, we are a community for underrepresented persons in data science. We organize events and we are a nonprofit organization. This is our team that makes it happen behind the scenes. We have a code of conduct and we thank you for helping to make this a welcoming, friendly community for all. There are various ways to support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct. We have a Discord server. Information on joining Discord is on our website. Uh, you can also donate to our nonprofit. We are an open collective as Data Umbrella. And if you work for a company that uses Benevity, what they do is they match dollar for dollar any employee donations that are made to organizations that are on Benevity. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, this will be, we have a really nice collection of presentations in data science and open source, and I will share the link to that in the chat um, as soon as I'm done with my intro. Uh, we have a lot of playlists um, on our YouTube. One of them is career advice. We have data visualization, data science for beginners, contributing to open source, uh, particularly scikit-learn, PyMC, and NumPy. We also have a monthly newsletter at dataumbrella.stubsack.com. We send out one email a month, and we promise not to spam you. Our website has a lot of resources on open source, accessibility, and responsibility, and we encourage you to check that out. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The ones that are highlighted here, Twitter and LinkedIn, are where we are the most active. Meetup is the place to join for upcoming events. It's the first place we post it. And we also have a blog, blog.dataumbrella.org, so you can see what we've been up to. This webinar platform is called Big Marker, and it does have live captioning. So if you go to the very top, there are two letters called CC for closed captioning. And so um, if you want to select that for English, I hear that English is really the best uh, translation. There are other languages, but I hear it's, a, you know, it's less, less perfect in terms of the um, captioning. Uh, for all of our webinars, we like to put timestamps on the YouTube videos, and the timestamps help uh, people get to the part of the video that they're most interested in, and also helps with search terms. So if you're interested in doing the timestamps for this video or any of our recent videos, um, I'll share the link to the GitHub issue in the chat. Our upcoming events for the rest of the year, November 15th, we're having Intro to Rust. I hear from social media that Rust is super popular, and so um, I looked for a speaker for that. Um, at the end of November, we're having Contributing to RVs and Open Source, and RVs is um, a visualization package that um, I sort of learned about through PyMC. Um, and on December 6th, we're having a data science career tips. So a lot of people have questions on navigating a career in data science or getting into a career in data science. And so we have that for December 6th. Today's talk is a bioimage data analysis workflow with scikit-image. Our speaker is Marianne Korbelek. Marianne is a core developer of scikit-image, where she specializes in applications of image processing to the life sciences and other scientific fields. Her technical interests include data science workflows, data viz, and best practices from testing to documenting. She holds a PhD in statistical physics from École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, France. Since 2013, she has been a regular speaker and contributor in the Python, Carpentries, and Floss communities. And you can find Marianne on GitHub at MKCOR. Uh, we're, you know, if you want to tweet about this event, our Twitter is at Data Umbrella. And so with that, I am going to um, turn off my mic and camera and hand it over to Marianne. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Reshma, for your introduction. And thank you for everyone else at Data Umbrella who make it happen. So I'll share my screen and start with the announcement by Data Umbrella. Um, 
So today I will walk you through a bioimage data analysis workflow with Scikit image. So after my presentation, I hope that you will consider using Scikit image when you need to analyze biomedical images. And maybe uh, you could contribute an other data analysis workflow in the life sciences to our gallery of examples. Um, for any contribution or any discussion, I encourage you to reach out um, over our discuss forum over here. So Scikit image is a Python library dedicated to image processing. It's part of the SciPy scientific Python ecosystem. So it works with, really well with NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and all these scientific Python libraries that you may be familiar with already. I'll point you to um, the talk Alex gave last week on Scikit image for 3D image processing because he also uh, introduced Scikit image and I'll try to uh, go a little faster on this part. Um, so uh, in the Eventbrite page under, under resources, um, I linked to a, a tutorial which is featured in our gallery of examples here. Um, th this workflow is about um, um, the migration of a protein from the cytoplasmic area of a cell to the nuclear membrane of the cell. Uh, it's based on a textbook uh, chapter, which is referenced to here, which itself is based on a research article by Andrea Boni and co-authors, which is reference one over here. Um, so here, basically, I'm porting this uh, data analysis workflow from ImageJ Macro, which were used, um, which was used uh, by this author, to Python and Scikit Image. Um, so I encourage you to uh, download the the notebook. So click here, and and here. So you will have this uh, this workflow as a Jupyter notebook and you can uh, run it with JupyterLab. So if you've dabbled uh, in scientific Python before, you probably know JupyterLab. It's very useful for you to share and save your work easily, uh, especially if you have in mind considerations such as reproducibility and collaboration. Um, so I'm assuming here that you have a running um, virtual environment uh, in Python uh, equipped with um, what I wrote under prep under prep work. So JupyterLab, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Plotly, and Scikit-Image. My apologies, I forgot to mention pandas. Uh, so uh, either pip install pandas or conda install. Uh, pandas from the um, Conda Forge channel. Uh, and pandas, by the way, is very powerful for data analysis because uh, it's inspired by R and the tidyverse. Just uh, a little digression for the community because maybe uh, not everyone at Data Umbrella specializes in Python, but maybe you come from R. So um, now you know that, uh, you know, the transition to Python is made very easy thanks to pandas. So um, I have fired up uh, JupyterLab already by with the command line, Jupyter-Lab, enter. And um, I'm doing this from where I have my uh, downloaded Jupyter notebook. So the first cell is the same as uh, the one in Alex's talk last week. So typical when you want to do scientific Python, you import matplotlib, numpy, and here from SciPy, we use the module and image, which specializes in uh, image processing. And we uh, use this magic MATLAB inline to display figures inside of this notebook. To import Scikit image, you have to run import skimage. And let's check that we have the same version running. We are running version 0.19.3. By the way, version 0.20 uh, should be coming up soon. We are working hard on it. Um, and more specifically from Skimage, uh, we will import um, 
these modules filters measure morphology and segmentation and probably with these names you recognize families of typical image processing tasks we will import plotly express as well because um, it's very powerful especially for exploratory data analysis uh, the io module from plotly uh, we use for rendering purposes in our gallery and plotly express um, another digression sorry um, is very much inspired by ggplot2 in r so again if you're familiar with the grammar of graphics uh, that probably rings a bell and my apologies again uh, there's another dependency that i forgot in the in the prep work uh, section, namely uh, Pooch. We use Pooch to manage our data set samples because when you install Scikit image, it comes with several data files that you can already play with. Um, and some of these data files live in a repository over here at gitlab.com slash image slash data. So please visit this URL, gitlab.com slash scikit image slash data. And if we search for Andrea Boni, control F, Andrea, here we have the um, origin of this um, data file. So you just, you know, right click, copy the link, and then paste it here between quotes to be able to read this volumetric data, hence the volread fun function from image.io. Um, I encourage you to use image.io because um, the IO module of scikit image um, will ultimately be only a thin wrapper around image.io. The vision being that um, we want to focus on actual image processing and hence delegate all other tasks, uh, all other functionalities, such as input output to other uh, libraries uh, focusing on those tasks. So let's uh, get a feel for this data. Um, this volumetric data is um, cons consists of 15 frames, so 15 time points. It's a time sequence. Um, each frame has two channels. We'll see what they contain, respectively. Uh, and uh, in the row dimension, we have 180 pixels. In the column dimension, we have 183 pixels. So now, if I run uh, this, this code um, from the tutorial, so I see that uh, channel 0 uh, visualizes mostly and roughly the nucleus of the cell whereas channel one visualizes mostly what's outside the nucleus. So the, the nuclear membrane and the cytoplasmic area. Um, I want to, so let me play this as an animated and interactive visualization. So in time, we're, so we're moving across time over these 15 frames. And you can see if you look at channel one that the intensity gets more and more concentrated at the nuclear envelope. But uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I realized that this um, intensity scale is moving all over the place, which is not, uh, well, frame by frame, why not? But you know, if we're playing this movie, it doesn't really make much sense. So um, to fix this, I will define a V min and a V max. Uh, I took the overall max um, in the data set. And I'm adding these these parameters. I'm passing a value for z min and z max um, in the function m show from Plotly Express. I really want to, uh, yeah, uh, encourage if you're not familiar with uh, m show in Plotly Express, uh, you probably know m show in Matplotlib, which itself was based on m show, I think, uh, in Matlab. But um, Plotly Express has taken it really to to another level. Um, so the, there's rich documentation here that explains you how you can um, visualize multidimensional data with MSHOW. And you see it's, it's a one liner. So it's like super powerful. Uh, so let me compute those min max values. And 
now if I'm playing this animation, then the scale is fixed, which makes a lot more sense. So to begin with, we'll just consider um, one image, so one frame with the two channels, um, because we want to segment the nuclear envelope and measure the intensity there. And then we want to have a measure for the increase of intensity over time. So uh, let's get like channel zero uh, at time point zero in this image sequence. Let me run all the um, all these code cells so that uh, we can visualize uh, what we mean and I, I can describe it. So there is a first um, step, uh, which is really typical in image processing. We uh, run a Gaussian filter over the image to smooth it a little bit. Then we threshold um, using Otsu's method to uh, segment the object. So Otsu's method um, basically consists uh, in considers the the histogram of all intensity values. And uh, if you want to find two classes, it will tell you it will get you the threshold that separates those two classes. There's also a multi Otsu um, threshold version where you can uh, if if you want like two levels, uh, two thresholds for three levels, et cetera, et cetera. It, it can be interesting as well, but here we're only segmenting the object from its background. Then we uh, call a function from ND image to fill in these holes. Uh, and then we use clear border um, to, um, so all our functions of course are documented. So to give you a look and feel, um, we use convention, the same conventions as NumPy, SciPy. Um, when you call a function uh, from from the tutorial, it's very easy to 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 click any function and and get its doc documentation and its source code. So I wanted to give this example with clear border. So here we can right click and and get this. Um, so clear border is removing this object that's touching the border. So we're keeping only one nucleus. And then uh, we are applying two morphology operations, namely dilation and erosion. Uh, in dilation, uh, a given pixel uh, at position, let's say IJ, um, gets the, val the maximum value in a given neighborhood. So, and the, the neighborhood uh, is, is called footprint in our parameters. And erosion is like the, so with dilation, uh, brighter re bright regions will be enlarged and dark regions will shrink. Erosion is the opposite. In a given neighborhood, you will, um, in, in, a, in the neighborhood for each pixel, you will take the, the minimum value of this neighborhood. And then if you go uh, dilation minus erosion, you're left with this nuclear envelope, which is the, the area we're interested in. So now uh, we apply this nuclear envelope as a mask onto the second channel, so channel one. So for the, for the first frame, this is the second channel, and we are applying the mask over it, so we're selecting only the, the actual nuclear envelope. And to measure the, the intensity here, which we expect uh, to, to increase over time. We use uh, the regions props function from um, in scikit image from the measure module. It's very, very convenient because it comes with, uh, you can you know, measure area, centroids, uh, all, all kinds of uh, properties that you're interested in. And, uh, and there's region props, but also region props table so that it, it speaks uh, Pandas language directly and it's straightforward to uh, read these properties as a Pandas data frame. So there's one region here. This is its area in pixels and the mean intensity is computed here. And now we can just do a, a quick check where um, so in this area, that's like the, the total uh, value of the intensities. And if we compute area times intensity mean, yeah, we'll recover the same value. 
Now let's process uh, the entire image sequence. So we will not do a naive for loop iterating over each frame, all 15 frames. Um, instead, we'll showcase the power of psychic image functions um, to work with uh, multidimensional images. Uh, so NZ uh, will store the number of frames, 15. Um, actually, there's uh, still a for loop we, we have to do for um, to get the threshold values because it's like by frame that we want the, the, this threshold. And uh, there's a way to write it without uh, without four, but uh, I'll, I'll let you check it out uh, by, by yourself. Um, it, it's still, um, you know, considering each frame separately. Uh, in terms of the Gaussian filter, maybe I, I can uh, dwell on this a little more. You see how um, in, interestingly, uh, so you don't need a, a for loop, definitely. Uh, you can take this um, volumetric data, so image sequence, uh, all 15 frames, only the first channel, uh, X and Y, row column, sorry. And then uh, by passing sigma, not as a scalar, but as a vector, you get what you want, which is basically you don't want to do the blurring across the time dimension, but you want it to do it along uh, X and Y. Um, there we go. So we have um, a sequence of smoothed images. Um, so that's uh, the, the trick to uh, not to use it for uh, a less comprehension, even for the thresholding part, but uh, I'll skip it today. And um, now uh, we'll generate a, a footprint a binary structure, which is, you know, a, a cross like this, but um, which again, along the, um, there's no neighborhood along the time dimension. It's only across X and Y so that whenever we're applying our processing functions on the volumetric data set, uh, we know that uh, we are, we're considering each frame by, by slice and not uh, doing, you know, like for example, the blurring across time as well. So this way each frame is processed independently. There are only spatial neighbor neighbors and there's no uh, notion of neighbors across time. So um, step, uh, I forget which letter it was, but like uh, fill in. So step C1 is done here across all the volumetric data set. I, I don't say 3D because uh, 3D sounds like, you know, spatial 3D. Uh, so whereas here we have time and 2D spatially. Um, and then to apply, so clear border. Yeah, remember that uh, I highlighted the, the docs for clear border. So um, we want um, labels, so basically regions and um, and uh, we, we can pass a mask uh, objects in labels image overlapping with false pixels will be removed. And here in, so in 3D, even though it's not spatially 3D, but um, we want to be careful. So um, I'm using probably graph objects to visualize this. We don't want to clear the borders that would be the top and bottom of the stack because um, again, these don't mean anything spatially. We don't want to get rid of um, the, the nucleus, uh, the first time, time point and the last one, because otherwise we would get rid of everything. See, but we want to get rid of that. We want to get rid of, of this nucleus in the corner. So that's why uh, here I'm uh, creating a, a border mask, which is set uh, where I, I'm setting to false this point here, which is roughly halfway in the in the stacking direction, stacking across uh, time, and uh, at the la last value in x, last value in in y. So that was a little trick um, I wanted to showcase. 
Uh, so let's run it. And again here, so um, we're, I'm calling uh, these uh, dilation and erosion functions from the morphology module uh, over the entire sequence. And thanks to the footprint, which I described to you, which, which has a cross only in X and Y, but um, doesn't create neighbors across time, we're able to, to do this again, avoiding a for loop and leveraging the, uh, the ND functionality of our functions. So uh, now we are labeling um, yeah, all, the, um, all the time frames from 1 to 15. Um, and uh, we can compute uh, the region properties of interest, namely the, the mean intensity. Um, for all these labeled regions, so uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 through 15. And here I'm just running a basic test to, to ensure that uh, the, the labels for all the identified regions go for R1, 2, etc. through 15. And now fluorescence change so i'm anticipating the, the name because then i'm normalizing um so here is a list comprehension um so we are computing the total intensity by multiplying the area by the intensity mean and uh, considering that the 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 intensity uh is normalized to one on the on the first time frame we'll see what happens over time so we are seeing an increase and then it, it kind of stabilizes. So here's the migration of our protein from the cytoplasmic area to uh, the nuclear membrane. So we're reassuringly, we find the expected results. So we are recovering the results that are presented in this research paper and in the textbook chapter. But actually, um, I noticed that the numerical values are not exactly the same. So um, I don't know if someone uh, in the audience, if a student, perhaps someone with time on their hands, uh, would like to um, compare all the, the values step by step in this processing, uh, maybe just considering, of course, one time frame uh, to begin with. Um, I'm, I would be happy to, uh, to assist them and to interact on this because it's something that, um, yeah, I've kept on the back of my mind. Uh, I've tried moving ahead with like other biomedical examples, but uh, I think that one day it is, it's something I, I would like to, um, I would like to get clearer on, on this. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, I'm happy to take questions now. Thanks, Marianne. Um, yeah, folks, um, while we have Marianne online, if you have any questions, uh, please ask uh, in the Q&A and we will answer them. Um, so I, while we're waiting for um, people to write their questions, if they have any, a uh, question I have is how, you know, for instance, how would people get in touch for this um, call for, call for comparing <laughs> something uh, for people? Yeah, good question. So I would point to our forum again. So here on discuss.scientificpython.org, uh, we have a skimage tag and a skimage category, uh, if that's the right name. And, um, and then uh, we're happy to uh, interact over this forum. Great. I'm going to add a link for that to uh, the video description. Um, so that is that. Um, and I will, while we're waiting for people, I just want to give people some chance to digest it. I know that, you know, also just a reminder to people that Alex DeSicara did a presentation just last week on where he did an introduction introduction to scikit image and so i guess we could consider that part one and this is part two and so um it's worth watching that and then you know putting that together 
Um, so let's see if there's a, um, you have the Absolutely. skimmage there as well. Okay. In the meantime, okay, let's see. I see a question there. Um, from my, do you need to do pre-processing when using simple linear iterative clustering? Seems that organelles introduce noise. I think the question is quite specialized and applied um, because I'm not a biologist. I, I gather that organelles are specific parts in, in the cell, um, but I don't know if they're referring to um, our tutorial if, or if they have something else in mind. I mean, clearly, yeah, there were some irregular uh, intensity values inside of the um, nucleus. And that's why we used these remove small holes um, function. Um, but simple linear iterative clustering, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the context is. So uh, I would need to take a look at the person's uh, notebook or if they can share their workflow. Uh, again, they, they're welcome to do so on our forum. Um, on GitHub, uh, I think you can always open an issue, but uh, it should be more specifically related to uh, the existing code base. Um, I think the form, the forum format is more suitable for, for discussions. But generally speaking, I, I think you, you always need some pre-processing with real world data because the, the raw data is never clean enough. So I would assume you always need a small step of uh, at least blurring, uh, maybe clipping the lowest and highest intensities, you know, typical things like this. Um, of course, it's a case by case thing, but uh, I, I would uh, I would bet that yes, you need pre-processing. The next question is um, from Robert, which is just a quick question about future perspectives of scikit image. Are there any plans by the scikit image team to develop more methods specifically tailored for bioimaging folks? Well, hello, Robert. Very nice to see you here. <laughs> um, yes, um, I. Well, that that's part of my uh, ambition. Also, with this talk, is like to uh, let people know that we are kind of uh, playing in the bioimaging field. Um, so uh, we're more than happy to consider requests uh, in this um, in this field. Um, yeah, for example, if you're um, uh, hitting a, a roadblock in your uh, bioimaging data analysis workflow and uh, you're trying to to do it with scikit image, um, I'm more than happy to uh, discuss this on the, for on the forum. Yeah. Then specifically tailored. I guess uh, it's it's a hard balance to, um, to strike because uh, we still want to be generalists in, in to some extent, uh, but we know there's uh, high demand in bioimaging, and uh, so we want to participate in in this effort. Um, we are a small team, so the maintenance um, effort is not negligible. And um, so the code base, uh, you know, uh, should grow and, and, and become uh, more and more um, powerful. But um, yeah, we also want to include things that are, you know, actually used with maybe a critical mass, whatever that means of, uh, of users. Um, so you know, the, the cutting edge of the research, probably, uh, I would say not yet, but, you know, as soon as it's part of, uh, I don't know what a, what an undergraduate student would do for sure. Uh, yeah. If that gives you an idea. <laughs> So, you know, I'm aware that CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, has a lot of projects that they're funding in the bioimaging space. And I'm sort of curious, where does Psychic Image fit into, into you know, the, the whole sort of ecosystem of, of image processing? And also, how does Psychic Image sort of determine what features to build next? You know, like, do you base it on GitHub? Like, 
you know, the number of comments on GitHub that people ask for it? Or how do you do that? Yeah, so your second question is uh, what I tried touching on uh, previously. Um, well, we uh, have criteria uh, for including uh, new features, new functionality. And uh, so it's not like a clear cut number, but uh, we, we try to uh, implement something that is in the literature cited so we know that there is a community using it um so actually uh, counting you know the use over github is a uh, maybe a good suggestion because so far we uh we were referring rather to uh you know academic style publications even though we had in mind that you know not every uh image not all image processing falls into uh the realm of academic research um but uh yeah it's a tough debate because uh sometimes uh we can be really excited about um adding a new feature but then we have to uh, weigh in the cost of maintenance that this implies um and with respect to uh the uh, overall imaging ecosystem uh well yeah we try to be um you know th this player as i said uh that are still generalists um so we are we try to um, to target the education world a lot. So like, well, higher education, but I mean, um, that makes it maybe not so cutting edge uh, because at some point, you know, cutting edge um, algorithms will always be tailored. So I'm not sure they, they can be, you know, readily part of uh, a library that's uh, well established and um, has a wide, uh, community uh, and user base. So um, yeah, we do get funding uh, by uh, CZI uh, under, uh, you know, essential open source software for science. Um, and uh, yeah, in the, um, in the current grant that uh, is ending very soon, uh, by imaging is, is part of the effort. It, it's not like the, the only uh, pillar, but uh, it's definitely a, an important thing and and that's why we are you know reaching out to the life scientists um to uh to see what their needs are and uh how we can uh develop the library with uh, with their concerns in mind and with their needs in mind thank you for that um and, uh, you know, I'll wait a couple of minutes to see if anybody else has any questions. Um, I sort of have a question is, do people often confuse scikit-learn and scikit-image? Um, and, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you answer the question first, yes or no. <laughs> apparently, yes, but it's not only people, even machines, apparently, because, uh, so we are also an open collective. And when I uh, searched open collective scikit-image, guess what? Like the, li the first link, was the open collective page for psychic learn <laughs> for a second image so uh, i thought well that that will not help with the confusion um but uh psychic image works with psychic learn because again it, it, it's a psychic it's part of the sci-fi ecosystem so uh you can um you know all the building blocks work well together Right. You know, when I first started working with Scikit-Learn, as you know, I'm on the contributing team. I used to call it Scikit um, because I, I thought, oh, well, you know, it's, it's a short name. I didn't realize. And somebody said, no, there's also a Scikit image. And I, it took me it took me a couple of years to get used to it. And um, I've been in touch with somebody in the stand team and they're actually working on a Scikit stand package. Um, and so for people, you know, not everybody knows, but Scikit I guess, stands for Scientific Python Kit. What, what toolkit. I was, yeah. A toolkit. Scientific toolkit. toolkit. Okay. Scientific toolkit. So there are, I don't know if there's other scikit extensions besides scikit learn, scikit image, scikit stand maybe coming along. Uh, I must say I don't either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I didn't know about scikit stand. Uh, it's great to see this uh, happening. At some point, I was interested in, um, in stan and Bayesian inference. Um, when I was 
in New York City. <laughs> but um, yeah, meanwhile, I've changed priorities. So um, I, I've fallen behind in terms of uh, keeping up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Alex was here last week and we talked a bit about, um, I asked him if the Scikit image had a um, Twitter handle and he said not yet, but I guess there there um, maybe needs to be some branding done around Scikit image. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I don't even have a Twitter handle myself, so I'm not the best person to ask about this and I'm not sure I will be the one, you know, pushing for it or making it happen. Um, yeah, I, I know that we're been discussing our logo for a while so we we're supposed to update it and um in terms of the website i think we have to um to take advantage of uh what the rest of the ecosystem is is doing so that we can just reuse the theme etc <laughs> um but yeah uh of course i think branding would be nice but um i think that uh the maintenance effort is already uh quite uh, a burden on the the few shoulders <laughs> that, that we have so um i don't know uh, maybe an, an intern a volunteer right yeah i don't know uh, if that's really the priority or maybe yeah we can uh maybe by having a mutual effort like if uh, we can just uh follow the, the wake of uh, similar efforts in the sci-fi ecosystem, I think that would be the, the best because uh, I don't think we can have uh, one person dedicated to branding for each scikit or each sci-fi package. <laughs> okay. Um, somebody has a question. Mind sharing about the biomedical image grant on the, on the Chan Zuckerberg initiative? Uh, they didn't see it on the webpage. Uh, it is on the web page, so I can find it for you um, maybe right after. Uh, um, yeah, um, and we'll write a report soon because we got an extension and it's ending at the end of this month. So we can report on everything we've done to uh, in terms of performance. Uh, so infrastructure, it's, it's not really my specialty. Um, but then, yeah, my, my work item, as they call it, is uh, maintenance, education, dissemination, and documentation. Um, so, you know, this tutorial that I've walked you through is um, long form documentation. But uh, as you know, documentation goes from, you know, the, like the doc string, the description for one parameter name with a good um, parameter name choice uh, up to these long form narrative documentation uh, formats. Um, and that's how uh, I think you, your library becomes discoverable, searchable, and, and ultimately usable and, and useful. Um, so I'll, I'll find you the link on the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative website. I can see there's another uh, question by Sam Sangam. Hi, I'm working on a drift detector for a classification model. How can I use psychic image metrics on a batch of data? Or do you suggest any other approach? Thanks batch of data that sounds like um, big data. Um, do you have just like a, a time sequence of multidimensional data? Um, well, the classification model, I think that would be more like on the scikit-learn side. But then uh, maybe uh, it might be that you you need some image properties uh, that I mentioned, region properties, for example, if you if you're able to segment your your image to uh, to get the objects that you're looking for, and then uh, you probably want to measure something on, on these objects. So so then site image would come into play with this region props function, notably. I don't see Reshma anymore. Um, Okay, um, I'm here. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, I just, um, I was actually searching. I found the link to the CZI. Um, it's funny, it wasn't, it didn't come up on Google search, or I think I use DuckDuckGo sometimes. Um, but I put the link in there. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I think I don't see any more questions. Um, 
So thank you so much uh, for presenting. Uh, we do encourage people to check out Alex's video first and then this one second because it adds context to it. Otherwise, the uh, you know the the event would have been too long. So it's broken down into two parts, and I'll I'll create a playlist for it and then share that with people. Um, so yes, Wonderful. And, yeah, thank you. Um, and so yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Thank you so much, Reshma. Thank you everyone who asked questions and everyone who attended.